Arnie, you've done some work on Einstein's brain. Now, people assume that Einstein was the smartest person in the 20th century, or certainly he was ex extremely intelligent. And if you could look at his brain, maybe that would tell us a lot. Did it? Some years ago, my wife and I, my wife, by the way, is Dr. Marion Diamond, who is on the faculty at UC Berkeley. Mary and I have married a long time, and we both enjoy what we do, and we obviously enjoy each other. We had wondered, are there visible substrates, and many other people have asked the same question, are there visible substrates for gift, for talent, for genius? As a matter of fact, uh, 50 years ago when I was in Germany, I talked to Oscar and Cecile Vogt, who showed me for the first time that you actually have, you can have more dendritic structure in an area for a person who has gift in that area. They showed me, for instance, the brain of uh, an artist who all his life had a, a phenomenon called eidetic imagery, the capacity to see something, look away, and have the visual image of what he saw remain with him. And in his visual cortex, the cells were farther apart, and the processes we call dendrites were much richer. And this was the first clue I had that you could see differences in the brains of people with talent. So, so there'd be more connections. More, exactly. And more opportunities for association. More options, absolutely. So obviously, Marion and I wondered if a remarkable brain like Einstein could show that. Uh, she was able to get small amounts of tissue from the person, the pathologist who had taken the brain out. And she and her graduate students were able to compare these with, uh, uh, I think, 10 or 11 uh, normal controls. Everybody is normal after Albert Einstein, <laughs> of course. And what we found was this. There is a species of neuroglial, or helping cell, in the brain. It's called the oligodendrocyte, which has the interesting property of reproducing itself more quickly around neurons that are working harder. Oh. And so it's possible, theoretically at least, by making counts of oligos correlated with neurons to see how many neurons need how many oligoglial, oligodendroglial cells, and then comparing that with the brains of individuals who supposedly don't have the gift. What she found was that in the parietal association areas, that is, parts of the brain here above the ear, which we know are powerful integrative association areas, in those areas, Albert Einstein had a significantly larger number of these oligodendrocytes around nerve cells than did normal controls. And this is interesting because we know that Albert Einstein was trying to do theoretical work up until within a few hours of his death. Mm. So his brain was, in a sense, in its pristine state. We thought this was very interesting. Now, recently, there have been reports out of Canada, actually, that looked at photographs of Einstein's brain before it was even cut up, but just after his demise. And there are changes, there are differences in the amount of cerebral cortex devoted to one lobe as compared to another. And this could also correlate with the amount of what we should, might call conceptual or higher level thinking that he was capable of compared to a so-called non-gifted control. So, rather remarkably, and we think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that it's true, one can begin to see anatomical correlations mm. to certain kinds of gift. Yet, we can never be sure the direction of causality. Exactly. Exactly. It, it could be that way that Absolute, caused it, absolutely. or the activity of some other kind of thing could yeah. have generated absolutely. it. So, Any, every observation, every experiment, talks about correlations. They say nothing about causality, right. and I'm very glad you <laughs> made that point. However, we do know from experimental work that under stimulus, nerve cells will produce more dendrites mm. and will gather more oligodendrocytes around mm. them. So there is at least a chance right. that this is a, a valid correlation.